And as mentioned, we'll explore seven insights to enrich your Passover Seder. So there you go, sharing my screen. Good. Can everyone see it? Yes. All right. Fantastic. Okay. All right. So let's dive right in. Let's go to insight number one. And uh, the, this insight really is an introduction, not just to the Seder itself, but to Passover altogether, to this festival of Passover, because What's interesting is that we are not just celebrating something that occurred over 3,300 years ago, but as Maimonides puts it, we are celebrating the grand exodus that occurs each and every day. In fact, uh, one of the great lines of the Haggadah that we read during the Passover Seder is dor vador chayav adam et atzmo, that everyone has to see himself, or even uh, in the words of Maimonides, et atzmo, to show himself as if he or she is going out of Egypt at that very moment. Now let's read how this can be achieved through this insight number one. Does anyone want to read? Why are we celebrating an event that occurred over 3,300 years ago? Anyone? I'll read. Thank you. Whoever said that. <laughs> <laughs> Julie. Go oh, for I it. need to change my um, thing. Okay. Thank um, you. Why we are celebrating an event that occurred over 3,300 years ago. The, the holiday of Pesach commemorating the exodus of the Jewish people from the land of Egypt also reflects the liberation of the soul from the psychological and emotional constraints represented by Egypt. What is Egypt? The Hebrew term for Egypt, Mitzrayim, may be translated as inhibitions or restrictions. All of us struggle with various inner and outer inhibitions that stifle our growth and prevent us from maximizing our potentials. We may be paralyzed by fear, insecurity, shame, guilt, doubts, conflicts, resentment, codependency, and addictions. We may be stuck in relationships, personal or at work, that are not good for us, but we are paralyzed to do anything about it. Conversely, we may be stuck in our inability to build a relationship. We may be lacking the ability to love, to dream, to cry, and to let go of our defenses. Or we may be enslaved by unhealthy urges and feelings of envy, animosity, and bitterness. We may be too afraid to be honest with ourselves and with others, to look ourselves in the mirror and make the hard choices we have to make. So here is a suggestion for the Seder night. Tonight, think of one particular thing in your life which is holding you back from greatness and how you can overcome it. Then make the resolution to do one daring thing that will help you get out of, out of this inhibiting Egypt. It may be as simple as making that telephone call that frightens you, confronting that person that scares you, changing that habit, jumping into that project, taking that risk, whatever it may be. You are the one who knows best and tonight you owe yourself the gift of liberation. Right, okay, so, so I, I wanna develop this idea just by focusing on the word freedom itself, because as, as uh, we just said, on a Passover, we are celebrating our personal freedom by coming out of our own Egypt, right? The word for Egypt, as just explained, is also the word for restrictions or limitations. In Hebrew, mitraim is the same word as meitzarim, same word, just different vowels, which again means restrictions or limitations, because on Passover, we are coming out of our own limitations. But I want to focus on a different Hebrew word to, again, develop this idea, and that's the word for freedom. The word for freedom in Hebrew is an interesting one because there are two words for freedom, but one of them is chofish. Chofish in Hebrew also means something else. It doesn't just mean freedom. Chofish in Hebrew means to search. It's the exact same letters as the word chapes, same order of letters too. Chet, pe, sin. Chapes, to search. Freedom means to search in Hebrew. Why so? And that is because to, in order to be free, the Hebrew language acknowledges that one has to search within himself, to go to the deepest part of himself, to go to the divine soul itself and ask himself at that point, is it being free to express itself or is it being uh, completely blocked or maybe even paralyzed by uh, some of life's challenges, some of the obstacles that we may face in the day to day, in our day to day lives? That's the big question. So we first have to search for our deeper self recognize that we have a divine soul, recognize that that divine soul also is infinite and has an infinite potential, and then allow it to express itself. That's freedom. That's freedom in Judaism. And if we cannot search within, 
and find that infinity within will never be able to be free. That's the same meaning for, uh, 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 you know, the same, this dual meaning rather of this same word, of the word chofesh or chapes in Hebrew. Now, I think there's a, the, the idea here is very profound because on, you know, there are festivals during the Jewish calendar in which we are told to go outwards. Maybe the festival in which we are told to go the most outwards is uh, Tu Bishvat, where we have to celebrate the world and go out to the trees and so on. Um, but there are other festivals, like the festival of Sukkot, where we live in a hut outside for seven days, right? But on Passover, we don't go outwards. Pas Passover is a festival in which we go inwards. Maybe that's why there's so much focus on having a Seder with the family in the home. But we have to go even more inward than that. And that's in our deeper self. There's a completely different direction to the festival of Passover. We have to search, search that for that soul and then enable it to uh, express itself and, and set it free. That's really the deeper idea. And that's this example at the end, really, this doesn't have to remain just in theory, but it can be translated into practice. We have to ask ourselves, what are the things in life that are limiting us? What are these restrictions that are not enabling us to be the best self that we can be, to, to exercise that divine soul that we each possess. Maybe it's a relationship that's gone sour and we have to tackle it on Passover. Or maybe it's a habit that's, that's bad for us, an addiction. Maybe it's uh, uh, you know, something that causes great fear and shame in our life that has to be again confronted. But everyone should prepare for Passover in that sense, by going inwards. It's not a festival that faces outwards. It's a festival that faces inwards because we can only truly be free if we go inwards and set a soul free. That's the big idea. I, I'm happy to, to listen to your comments and to, to discuss your disagreement, whatever you may have. Otherwise we can move to insight number two. But does anyone want to share anything? No, okay. <laughs> All right. Don't be ashamed. Don't be shy. Maybe that's something that we need to work on for Passover. <laughs> Get rid of that shyness. Okay. All right. So that's uh, inside number one. Inside number two goes to three items that are necessary from a halachic standpoint, from a Jewish law standpoint, uh, during the Passover night. These three items are wine. Uh, you know, everyone drinks. We all know that we have to drink four cups of wine. And good luck with that. Some <laughs> you can substitute the wine with uh, grape juice, um, but wine, four cups of wine. And then you have the maror, the bitter herbs. Some use horseradish, some use lettuce, some use onion. And of course, there's the biblical mitzvah of eating matzah on Passover. These are three items that we have to eat during the Seder night, but they represent something much deeper. And in a way, they draw for us this map to freedom. Let's read the next inside. Does anyone want to read the three most important ingredients? I'll read Sue. <clears throat> the okay, three most it. important ingredients. Andy, you'll read the next one. Okay, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. Oh. I can't see everybody because everyone's on, on the oh, side here. Oh. So no problem. It's, go for it, please. Okay. Yes. The three most important ingredients at the Seder table are the wine, matzah, and maror, bitter herbs. For these three items capture the three foundational ideas that can allow us to set ourselves free. Right. The first step is wine. Wine has incredible power. When wine enters, secrets come out. S secrets come out, says the Talmud. Right. Wine represents the secrets in us, for wine itself is a secret. It is initially hidden and concealed within the grape and it takes much labor to extract it from the source. The grapes have to be crushed and the wine to ferment. Wine, an intoxicating beverage that is at first concealed within the grape, represents the deeply concealed powerful forces lingering within the human psyche. The first right. step, oh, should I go no, on? Continue, continue, yes, please. The first step in setting yourself free is realizing how much more there is to you than what meets the eye. You must recognize your potential, what you were really meant to be, what you are capable of becoming for you break out of the chains. Right. Okay. I want to share the same story I shared during my 
uh, soul, soul study on Sunday mornings, and everyone is welcome at 7.45 a.m. each and every Sunday. Um, but the story I shared, uh, I think, two weeks ago. But um, just to this point, uh, I remember meeting a, a friend of mine who's a pilot, and he was telling me that when he was young, uh, he would daydream in class, and he would always look outside through the window. And uh, his teacher would often come to him and say, nothing will come out of you. No one will ever give you a salary for staring outside the window all day. And you better, you know, size up and, and start focusing and learning. Now, um, today, this man is a pilot. And what he does all day is stare outside the window. Daydreaming. That's what pilots do. <laughs> and thank God there was someone in his life that saw that talent that he had or that potential that he had and he said oh you're not just daydreaming you're looking outside you're looking to the heavens because that's where your soul belongs that's where your purpose in life belongs and eventually indeed fulfilled that purpose instead of crushing the talent that he had because someone couldn't see what he saw uh, someone was in his someone later on not that very teacher but someone later on saw that talent that he saw that potential that he saw and channeled it in the best of way. Today's a great pilot. But I'm sharing with you the story because in a way, that's that first step, the step that represents wine. That sometimes we see ourselves daydreaming and we say to ourselves, oh, we're just losers. Or we see others daydreaming and we say, oh, they're losers. But maybe there's a hidden talent, a hidden purpose in that act of daydreaming, in that act of staring at the heavens. Maybe there's something much deeper and we can't be stuck by that which our naked eye sees. There's something, there's a secret. There's a secret within each and every human being, a secret that maybe holds the keys to fulfilling our purpose in life. And that's what wine does. Wine reveals those secrets, right? That's, that's the idea of wine, at least. And that's why on Passover, we drink four cups of wine because we know that we can't be fully free if we haven't revealed the secrets that uh, sometimes we just can't see, other people can't see in us. So that's step one. Step two, Maror, go for it, uh, Sue, if you want to continue. Oh, uh, <clears throat> this comes together with step two, the Maror, representing the bitterness caused by slavery. You have to remember how dysfunction the slavery is in order to be inspired towards liberation and to actualize freedom in your life. The most dangerous darkness is when you think it is light. Right. For a Jew not to be fully in sync with his or her inner soul with the essence of existence is slavery. It creates a void, an inner emptiness, a lack of real joy. That is the maror. That is what allows us and encourages us to grow in our lives as humans and as Jews. Right, right. In a way, I think that, you know, uh, I've said this in the past, but I think that there's a statistic that, that uh, represents this. Because it's interesting to know, right? If you ask a child what, what he or she wants to be when they grow up, they'll tell you, I want to change the world. Or first, they'll tell you, I want to be a fireman. Then they'll tell you, I want to be a policeman. And then they'll tell you, I want to be Bob the Builder. But when they grow up a little more, you're right. And they're, uh, when they're 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, that's when they want, want to achieve big things. Teenagers also want to achieve big things. But then life hits us and we settle for less. And when you turn 30, when you turn 40, you realize, gosh, even that less that I settled for is uh, too much. Hello. Hello. Yes, yeah, something happened. Yeah, Rabbi, you're frozen. I don't know if you can hear us. Hello. Rabbi. Okay, I will tell him. Uh... I think he left. Let's see. Let me check. <laughs> no, he should be on. He should be on. He would get disconnected, but he wouldn't leave. No. No. His just computer probably froze. His computer I just tested froze. him, yes, to see maybe... I'm back. Yeah. I'm back. Okay. I don't know what happened. But yeah. the sheets aren't on. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, we can, but you we lost you for a while. Oh, and no. I don't have the your sheet. screen was your screen was completely frozen, so we didn't hear. How about now? How about now? Perfect, perfectly fine. fine. But the 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 sheets aren't on my screen. No, okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. There you go. Oh, okay. There you go. So I don't know where I was, but I, what I was saying is that my personal model, of course, is Rabbi Steins. I've spoken about so many times. But Rabbi Steins, I remember towards the, the older he got, the more he wanted to achieve, the rest, the more restless he became. Now you can say it's not such a good quality and affects your health and who knows what. But in a way, that symbolizes what the moral you, you represent. And we can never settle for less. We can never say, oh, you know what? I worked hard enough. I'm, I'm done. I'm going to go and live on an island for the rest of my life. God gave you another day today for you to achieve more today than you achieved yesterday. And every day we must strive to grow and grow and grow. As the, the book of Psalms says, as King David himself writes, Michael el Chayo, from strength to strength. And that's the purpose of life. And that's where the moral comes into play. Don't ever be completely satisfied. Have a little bit of bitterness that shakes you up and enables you to continue to grow. That's the moral. And number three, the matzah, that's step number three. Does anyone want to read this? Then we have the critical step of matzah. Please, Julie, go for it. I saw you raising your hand. Oh, okay, Mindy, I'm sorry. Whoever. Me or Julie? Whoever, whoever, okay. right. I'll Doesn't... go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Then we have the critical step of matzah. We eat the matzah, says the Haggadah because the Jews did not have time to wait till the dough has risen. They rushed out of Egypt. I want you to ask you, I want to ask you, they waited for 210 years. They could not wait another few hours. What was the rush? The answer is beautiful. The greatest enemy to setting yourself free is delaying things. Hard decision and bold moves. The message if matzah is, when it comes to setting yourself free, you have no time to wait, even an extra 18 minutes. Do it now. Make that call now. Send that email now. Make that move now. Set up that meeting now. Make that decision now. Start the new behavior now. Confront the situation now. Start doing it now. Or as the Libo, Libo Vitcher, Libo, how do you say that? Libo Vitcher, yeah. That's my yes. Libo Vitcher. Rabbi. Put it, anything worth doing is worth doing now. Right, that's a play on the phrase of anything worth doing is worth doing well. Uh, any worth, any, anything worth doing is worth doing now. You know, the famous teaching of Hillel the Elder, Imlo yeah. matai. if not now, then when? And the yes. deeper spiritual reason for that is because maybe that opportunity won't present itself again. God is giving it to you right now for you to act on it now. And if you can't act on it now, then God will say, you know what? I'll take that opportunity away and give it to someone else that can act on it now. I need it to be done now. I thought you could do it now. If you don't want to do it now, that's fine. I'll take the opportunity away and give it to someone else. There's a reason why everything happens when it happens. And if an opportunity therefore presents itself now, it happens because God wants us to do it now. Yes, Linda, I, I know you were raising your hand. Yeah, I, I didn't know you could see me. So anyway, hi, Rabbi. Hi. Uh, hi. One of the comment was that... Um, you know, sometimes when you quote, do it now, it's something that you don't get the result that you wanted, but you get a result and it allows you a certain freedom or to move on, you know, because I, I don't want there to always be the assumption that when you're called to do something, to send that email, that it's going to like open up everything you wanted to, sometimes it slaps you back in the face, but that is also an answer. So, right. you know, and then that gives you a liberation to like, you know, however painful it might be to kind of step back and say, okay, here's an answer. Now I need to move forward. And it might be different than what I was thinking or hoping when I sent that email, right. but it right. is um, still, like it's important to get an answer sometimes, however painful it might seem at that time, because it takes you to another place. Right. No, that's that's a very good point. And I would I would say that, you know, it's it's pointing really to two different things. And number one, uh, the line here of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, anything worth doing is worth doing now. Of course, you have to ensure that this thing that you're about to do is worth doing. Otherwise, don't do it now and don't do it ever. 
that's that's so you first have to define what what whether you know you have to first have to decide and think about it really heavily whether it's worth doing because if it's not worth doing don't do it at all no but but sometimes things are worth doing that like they take you to an answer of something you need to know maybe you've been avoiding trying to get that answer so i'm just i'm just trying to like focus on the fact that sometimes Although, you know, sometimes what seems to be so terrible can take you to a place you never would have been had you not had that answer. Right, right. And I think that's that's the, the other point also. And that is that, you know, sometimes you do things, but at the end of the day, our uh, vision is limited and we can do our part, but we don't know exactly how that piece of the puzzle that we are adding to the master puzzle is going to fit. We still have to try and put it in, but right. God, it takes care of the rest of the pieces of the puzzle. And sometimes it fits, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it completes the picture, sometimes it doesn't. We just have to, to dedicate ourselves. And like you said, we have to accept the fact that, or the idea that sometimes it doesn't fit the puzzle. And that's but just sometimes, fine. Sometimes it doesn't fit the puzzle, but perhaps it really is fitting. It is not fitting what your expectation right. was. Right. So it's, right. it's kind of like actually fitting for you. You just don't yeah. know it just That's right. Yet. It doesn't fit your puzzle. It fits God's puzzle, but it right. doesn't fit exactly. your puzzle. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Very good. Right. Right. Okay. Yes, Mindy. Overall, this is saying take action. I love this whole part because it's all about just take an action. Don't just sit back. Do right. something. Right, right. And I, very good, very good. That's right. I, I would also, um, and I don't know if there's statistics about this again, but I would dare say that most people who made a dent in history, so to speak, you know, it doesn't matter in which world, whether in the world of sports or in the world of mathematics, it doesn't matter, but are people who lived by this, who took action, like you just said, and they didn't wait for things to be done. They were themselves in the driver's seat. They believed that anything worth doing is worth doing now. And uh, that eventually led them to become who they became. But you can't make a dent in history if you don't have that attitude. Yeah. And that's, that's where, again, the step of the matzah so, so, comes in. And it's, that's where it's so crucial. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking about what you said before about the man you know, your friend who stared out the window, excuse yeah. me. <clears throat> yeah. and, and I'm thinking about that too, the importance of that, because that's an action too. You know, visual, right. visualizing and staying with what it is that's that's coming to you and nurturing it. it. It's like nurturing a seed and you're still doing something. It may not just be uh, overwatering. It may not be over intending like that action, but I can only speak for myself. So I get a lot of ideas, but sometimes, and I love to take action, but sometimes I need, I need to let them um, germinate. Right. They need to germinate. Right. And then it shows me a, pa- a path. It may not be the path I wind up on. I mean, right. it may, it just, it's just a little sprout, a sprout, mm-hmm. but, but it leads to something else. So I think there's, right. There's the action doing, and then there's also the receiving uh, of letting right. things germinate and then taking action. Right, I agree. And, but we have to be honest with ourselves because we really have to ask ourselves, am I, am I taking a step back to let things germinate or just because I'm too lazy? If you are indeed letting things germinate and therefore you're taking that step back, then yes, it is a type of action like you just said. But uh, we have to ask ourselves that question question really honestly and if the answer is because you know what i'm hesitant i don't know i'm afraid then maybe it's time to move forward towards you know veritable action but otherwise germinating i think is a very important step to any action right right okay thank you thank you for that joyce thank you okay let's go to insight number three blunt his teeth now, this uh, refers to this, uh, the, the, the step of the Agada in which we speak of the four sons, right? The wise, the wicked, the innocent, and the one that does not ask. Now, um, the wicked, we are told we have to blunt his teeth. What, what does that mean? Really? Are we advocating for violence here? What, what does it mean? Hakeh chinav in Hebrew, blunt his teeth. 
So does anyone want to read? Really? A call for violence at the Seder table and towards whom? Does anyone want to read? Please. And, and, read. and oh, go ahead, please. Yes. Who said that? Uh, Julie. Julie, oh, I see you now. Okay. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what does the rebellious child say? What is this service you are doing? You too blunt his teeth. Really? A call for violence at the Seder table? And toward whom? Toward your own child? There is, in truth, a deeper message here. It is the source of the expression, answer the person, do not answer the question. There is what we see and hear, the behavior of the other person in their words, and there is what we don't see, the inner feeling of the other person. Your child may be yelling, throwing things, or hitting his sister. He is completely reckless and lacks any form of decency and obedience. Should he be disciplined? But what is going on beneath the surface? Is he anxious about an upcoming exam? or perhaps he is being teased in school. You see, the more we can go beneath the surface, the closer we are to dealing with the root of the problem. When we hear the voice of a, re of a rebellious child, we often get carried away in what he says instead of looking beyond the word to what he is truly feeling. So how are we to respond? Says the Haggadah, break his teeth. Don't enter into, into a dialogue. Let this not be about teeth versus teeth, and who screams louder wins. Show him or her with unconditional, shower him or her with unconditional love. Simply overwhelm him or her with enormous affection and acceptance until they see that there is no such thing as an outsider. We are all already inherently belong. Right, that, you know, I'm gonna speak about another Hebrew word. We spoke about the word Egypt. We spoke about the word freedom, kofesh, chapes, which means to search. But there's another interesting Hebrew word which is the word for violence. The word for violence in Hebrew is alimut. Now, alef lamed mem bav taf, alimut. What's interesting is that the word for violence in Hebrew is the same word as the word for mute. Mute, to be mute. Ilem in Hebrew. Why is that? That's because really uh, someone who is violent is someone that is mute. What does that mean? He's not mute in his words or in his ability mm. to move his mouth. He's mute in his ability to express his feelings. He's so bruised on the inside that he uses violence as a way to express his feelings instead of really speaking about them. He does not speak about them. He's mute in that sense. He's just too hurt. So what's his mechanism of defense? Violence. That's, that's why really the word for violence means mute. Again, because the person that is violent sometimes is, is because the, the, he retorts to violence because he's so bruised, he's bleeding so deeply on the inside that he does not express that hurt, but through violence. He's mute in, the, in, his, in his ability to express his hurt. So that, that's the word, but I'm saying this is, this is exactly what this is saying, that the Russia, we, we can't look at his words. We can't look at the external expressions. We have to go deep inside. The reason he's acting like a wicked person is simply because he might be just so hurt and he doesn't know how to express that hurt, but through being wicked. And I think that's one of the great, really one of the great ideas in, in relationships altogether, not just in education. I recall, I don't know if I've ever shared this with you, but my dear friend is Shmuley Green, whose father was a professor at NASA. And in the 1950s, he decided to come closer to Judaism. And uh, he was very, very disconnected or unaffiliated, as they call it. And uh, he had a long relationship, a very close relationship with the Lubavitcher Rebbe, our Shnitzan of Blessed Memory. And at uh, his early stages of reconnecting to Judaism, he, as a professor, he wrote a letter to the Rebbe with 27 questions. I think it was 27 questions of how he believes science uh, negates religion or Judaism altogether. And he was asking the Rebbe for some answers. And the Rebbe ignored his letter altogether. After three years, three, four years, the Rebbe related to, to uh, wrote him a letter on another subject and another uh, uh, topic that he had brought. And in the PS, he wrote an answer to each of these 27 questions. And then the Rebbe concluded uh, that paragraph saying, you may be wondering why I waited three years 
to answer your questions of three years ago. And he replied that that is because my job in life is not to win arguments. My job in life is to bring people closer to Judaism. Now that I see that you become closer to Judaism, I can answer these questions. But it's a powerful sentence because again, sometimes we forget that our job in life should not be to win arguments. Teeth versus teeth, like we, we wrote over here. Our job in life is to relate to the person, to bring him closer, not just to Judaism, but to life altogether, to love altogether. Once that person is close, then we can speak. Then we can relate to his teeth. But many people get stuck on the teeth level. And that only brings confrontation. It only brings tension. It only brings division. And if only we could relate to really to the person behind the question, not just the teeth themselves. And that's, that's really what this is saying. So that's insight number three. Does anyone want I, to add anything? Yes, I please. A question. I'd like yes, to please. share something if I can, yes, Rabbi. Yes. Go for it, yes. It's reminding me uh, of a story I might have said. When I lived in Hawaii, I worked with uh, residential children and residential teenagers in residential treatment. And I remember one girl coming in with a big history of violence. And she, they weren't even sure they were going to keep her. And in, in, she was a big Samoan girl, beautiful, beautiful, like Gogon painting. Right. And she was like this, and I'm just saying this quickly because she was very angry. She looked angry and she had, you know, been violent. So I let her just do her thing, you know, we were together and I just somehow, I looked at her and I said, you know, has anybody ever told you, you have a really beautiful heart? And I said, and I really saw, I mean, I saw it too. and she she just stopped and and she she said you see that I said of course I see it right. anyway that's how the conversation went and within a few seconds she was crying and we were holding holding and she taught me so much because you know, you're not taught to do that and as a therapist supposedly you're looking but you your, the heart is there. And this yeah. was all like you're saying. Her, yeah. Everyone That's was reading teeth to teeth. So it was yeah. very powerful. And it, and it really, I still to this day remember her. I can see yeah. her. No, beautiful. Really, really beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. If only we can all relate to people like that. Yes, Linda. You know, Rabbi, I want to go back to what you were just talking about briefly, because when you were talking about some people, you know, they can't express themselves. So they, they're mute and they become violent. What really came up with me was the concept of people using muteness or not speaking as a, um, as a tool. You know, like when people stop speaking to one another, you know, right. how to, you know, like, and, and it was just the concept of that, that, you know, that, um, you know, years ago, my sister was dating someone and married him and he used to brag that he would stop speaking to his parents for weeks and that scared the shit out of my parents. And I mean, I mean, it's like that, that, that so just being mute, actually being mute can be used violently right. in and of itself, that, that that itself can be a violent act. No, for sure. Yeah, look, uh, there's a, a, a great author. I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard of her. His na her name, she's Jewish, actually. The name is Marion Williamson. Yeah. And she says that the two types, the two types of people in this world, those who love and those who shout for love. And uh, whether you agree with that or not, it doesn't matter. But the point is that sometimes that silence uh, of not speaking to one's parents or uh, violence or becoming wicked like that second son of the Haggadah is really just a shout for love. And if we could identify that, we would relate to it differently. We wouldn't be, you know, engaging in a teeth to teeth, teeth versus teeth uh, battle. That's, that's the idea here. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Okay, all right. Uh, insight number four. Does anyone want to read again about children, not the cookie? model, the cookie cutter model, sorry. So speaking of these four children, uh, does anyone want to read? Yeah, three critical educational points have been conveyed in this passage. Anyone? 
Rabbi Zellin, I will. No, please, thank you so much. Thank Certainly. You. The Torah speaks of four children. One is wise, one is wicked, one is simple, and one does not know how to ask. Three critical educational points are being conveyed in this passage. Number one, no two children are alike and not two children can be spoken to alike. We sometimes want to create a cookie cutter model where one size fits all. 3000 years ago, the Torah told us it will not work. The message you give one child is not the one you can give to a second child. There are different types of children with different personality types, skills, challenges, and gifts. You must find the proper words to speak to each one. You must discover the proper mechanisms through which to penetrate each one of them. Right. Okay. Excellent. That's one. Let, let's let's read all three and then we'll maybe develop right. ideas. Yeah. All right. Number two, despite these four being so different, they are all your children. Never give up on any of them or tell yourself that this one is too difficult. Do not want to, or I can't deal with him, her. This approach is categorically rejected. All these four are your children. They may dif made different in so many years, but what unites them is that they are your children. You must and can be here for each of them. Good, yes. number, number three, the Torah speaks to each of the four children. Do not think that the Torah is a general document that works for many or most children, but there are some outcasts, misfits to whom the Torah does not relate. That is never the case. The Torah speaks to every child, Judaism contains truths that can be related to every single child. We must, however, search for the proper words and approach of how to make the Torah relevant and palpable to these children. We must discover how to give them the Torah in a way that they will appreciate how it speaks to their individual life with all of their struggles and issues. Right. I think these words speak for themselves. I just want to share on a personal note. I just, as mentioned before, just came back from Israel for a very brief visit where I had the privilege of being with my brother and his wife who just gave birth to twins after many years of, of being childless. And it was quite amazing. One of the things that we noticed, of course, is that even though they're twins, they are very different. And they are very different at this young age, the age of one day old, two days old, you can already tell that they're different. That's the way God creates us. Everyone is different. Even twins are different. And, and we see those differences already at the very, very uh, beginning of life. And therefore, the ultimate educator does not try to superimpose his own beliefs and ideals on uh, the child, but rather he tries to channel the strength and the, the talents and skills of the child in the best of ways, to channel the differences of the child in the best of ways. And this is really what Agatha is teaching us here. No two child are alike. There are all our children with their differences, and the Torah can be applied to each one of them and their differences too. That's Rabbi, Rabbi. Yes. Uh, but isn't it also true that each one of us has part of each one of the children? That each that each one of us has what? Say that again. You know, like each child is a certain way, but each one of the children has a little bit of the other child in them. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, certainly, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, if you go to the uh, biology of it, yeah, the, we share the same DNA and uh, etc. cetera, uh, maybe characteristics too. But still, I think the main composition of every human being is different. Right, right. But we all have a little bit. A little bit, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. No, very good, yeah. I mean, if we want to go deeper, of course, we each have the same soul on a soul level. We're all the same, not just completely the same. We have the same divine soul. We're all, you know, we're all containing within us a piece of God, which is the divine soul. And that's because, the same. Because all of us are sometimes the mean one or, yeah. some, you know, anyway. Right. Okay, yeah, thank you. All right, insight number five, which I think you'll all like, and that's why I put it in. Yeah. And that's really a kudos to all women out there. But does anyone want to read? <laughs> I'll read? This is based on a line again in the Haggadah, Vehi Sha'amda. The word Vehi means, and she stood for us. So the big question is, who's this she? Does anyone want to read? Yeah, there is a question. I will. Go, please. Uh, 
it's this that has stood strong for our ancestors and us. There is a question as to what the this is referring to. What was it that allowed us to endure? Some have suggested that it is referring to the Jewish women. The he means she, her. It is an expression of third person feminine. Our survival as a people is thanks to her. In Egypt, <clears throat> I mean, in the merit of the righteous women of the generation, our ancestors were redeemed from Egypt, the Thomas states. Mm -hmm. As the Midrash explains, after many decades of the Jews being subjected to harsh slave labor in Egypt, the Jewish men had all but lost hope in redemption and had no desire to reproduce. The women, however, were confident that redemption was coming and were determined that the Jewish people continue on. Despite the horrible conditions, they consoled their husbands, reassuring them that they would not stay enslaved forever and they enticed them toward intimacy. Their defiant answer to the decree of sterilization was to continue to create and nurture life. And mm -hmm. sure enough, the children that were brought into the, the world were the ones who witnessed God's miracle, miraculous redemption of the Jewish people from Egypt. Right. They are the ones who ensured the, the creation of the next generation. And they, of course, are the ones who also served as the source of strength and support and encouragement and comfort for the Jewish people altogether. In fact, if we go to the very, it's, you know, it's, it's maybe sometimes overlooked, but if we go to the very essence of the Jewish story, which began in Egypt, right, in the story of Passover, we find that it was two women who ensured the uh, continuity of the Jewish people. The first one was the daughter of Pharaoh who found Moses on the Nile River floating. And she went and saved him. We all know the story. But the, her name was Batya. This is the first woman. The second one was Miriam. Miriam was the sister of Moses who was staring at the basket of Moses in the Nile River. And when she saw that Batya found Moses, she ran to Moses saying, hey, I have a woman that can nurse this baby. She didn't, of course, reveal to Batya this that it was her own mother, Moses' mother, who could nurse this baby. But she eventually brought Moses' mother to the palace, and she was the one who nursed this baby. So here you have two women, or even three women, because Moses' mother is included, who really ensured the survival of Moses, who became the Jewish leader, who took the, Jewish, the Jews out of Egypt. So really, at the very essence of our story, at the very beginning and foundation of our story, we have three women. And uh, it is thanks to these women and all of the women of all generations that uh, Jewish continuity is ensured and con Jewish continuity in a way uh, thrives and blossoms. So that's the Vihisha Amda, the she that stood for us that we speak about in the Haggadah. It's a time also, we do this, that during the Seder, it's a time to pause and say thank you to the, to the, to the ladies that, we, that have uh, shaped our lives. So it's a it's, it's an important uh, and I think a very interesting, not just interesting, it's a very important and a very, I would say, very defining moment during the Seder night. So take a moment to think about the woman in your life who have brought hope and strength, etc. Okay, let's go to insight number six. Dayenu, a blueprint for life. We all know the song. We all sing it many times. But what does it mean? Does anyone want to read? Number six. There seems to be something disturbing. I'll read again. Please. <clears throat> there seems to be something disturbing when we look at some of the words of the Dayenu. If you had split, had split the sea, but had not led us through it in dryness, Dayenu, it would have been enough. Really, could that really have been enough? What would we gain from a parted sea if we could not get through it and escape the progressing Egyptians? We sing further, if he would have drowned our oppressors in the sea, but did not provide for our needs in the desert for 40 years, Dayenu, it would have been enough. 
again, we need to ask the question, would it really have been enough? We would have died in the desert and the list goes on. The truth is that Dayenu is much more than just a simple melody, a catchy tune, a children's song. It contains a tremendous, profound message. It teaches us how to look at life. A person can live life with two very different perspectives. You can always focus on what you are missing or you can focus on what you have. This is the message of Dayenu. Of course, we did not want to remain stuck in the desert or by the sea, etc. But Dayenu teaches us that we take nothing for granted. We appreciate everything. Dayenu tells us, be grateful for everything and say Dayenu for everything. In order to have a meaningful life, in order to be free, we need to be grateful for every single blessing in life. We ought not to take anything for granted. Indeed, whatever we have is a gift. Right. Okay. And that's the deeper meaning of Dayenu. I just want to share very quickly, but I remember um, reading a letter of uh, a response, a letter of the late Lubavitch Rebbe to a woman who was complaining to him about anything and everything. And he responded to her, look, I'd like to, to make a juxtaposition for you. On the one hand, you have Adam and Eve who had everything in life, but they felt that they had nothing because they couldn't eat from the forbidden tree, the tree of knowledge. On the other end of this juxtaposition, you have a person in the Holocaust, the Jew in the Holocaust, who wakes up every morning and has really nothing in life, but he has, he musters the courage to say, to say the first prayer, first Jewish prayer of the day, thank you, God, for restoring this, your, my soul in me. So here you have two different people, Adam and Eve, and this man in the Holocaust. One has everything, yet they have nothing. One has nothing, yet they have everything, because it's all a matter of perspective. And Dayenu teaches us the right perspective to have in life. We might have nothing, but let's focus on that which we do have. That's so within us, that is restored in us each and every day. And uh, the uh, many other blessings that, thank God, we are all fortunate mm. to have. And then we'll know that we have everything. That's insight number six. Insight number seven, final insight, is towards the end of the Seder. As we all know, we go and open the door to Elijah the prophet. What's behind this custom? What's the deeper meaning? Does anyone want to read here the very last insight? A remarkable ceremony. I'll read it. Please, really, go for it. A remarkable ceremony was instituted by Rabbi Naftali of Rapshitz. The right. cup of Elijah, symbol of the messianic future, was passed from person to person at the table. Each person poured a little wine into Elijah's cup from his own cup until it was filled. Filled. The tradition expressed the truth that Elijah's cup is filled from all of our wines. We must act together, each contributing his own best talents and energies to bring Elijah's promise to the world. Only through the efforts of our hands will the world be redeemed. Right. That be, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Beautiful. Thank you. But uh, it, I just want to point out, maybe uh, end off where we started. So we said that Passover is a festival in which we go inside to search for our divine soul. Throughout the Seder night, that's what we try to do. We search for it. We search for its story. We search for its purpose. Once we found it, though, then we have to go out again to the world. And in a way, that's the opening of the door for Elijah. Once we find that Elijah within, it's not enough to say, oh, look how great I am. Look at the immense potential I have. But go and do, do something about it. And therefore, we open the door and we say, okay, now it's time to bring it to the outside and actualize the Elijah so that it shines and illuminates the world. You know, I'll conclude with this cute story about the baby camel in a zoo, maybe in the Phoenix Zoo. He once went to her mother and said, mom, why is it that we have big eyelashes? And the, her mom said, that's because when we walk and walk and walk and walk in the desert, there's sometimes sandstorms. So God protects us by giving us long eyelashes so that we can uh, ensure that no, no grain of sand goes into our eyes. She says, oh, I understand. Can you tell me, mom, why do we have two uh, hunches in our back? And mom says again, that's because when we walk and walk and walk and walk in the desert, we can store water over there and then uh, we don't have to drink for 30 days. Great. Mommy, why do we have such big feet? That's because in the desert, sometimes it's very hard to walk on the sand. And when we walk and walk and walk, it makes it easier. So the baby camel then turns to the mommy camel and says, that's so great, mommy. But if, if we have all these talents, all these bodily parts that are just magical, what are we doing in a cage, in a zoo? <laughs> <laughs> in a way, 
This is what we do on Passover. We go and we find out that we are Elijah's, that we have so many uh, talents, so many long eyelashes, so many large feet and so on. But we, once we find that out, we have to say to ourselves, okay, while we're in the zoo, let's exercise our own grand exodus. Let's come out of that cage and let's go and share these strengths, these talents, these skills with the world around us and fulfill the purpose for which we were created. That's really the big idea of Passover, to go inside and then to go outside to share our divine soul and all of its gifts with the world.